Well, the haters gonna hate, 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 and the fakers gonna fake, 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 baby. I'm just gonna make, 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 making luck, making luck. A demanding podcast. Welcome back to Making Luck, and we have a lot to cover this week, so I'm just gonna jump right in. We're gonna start with the kingdom from last week. Actually, we're going to start with a meta discussion about the segment because I got no feedback, and I mean literally no feedback, uh, about the kingdom from last week, which is fine, but if the reason for that is you don't like or don't care about the segment, it would be nice to hear that feedback, um, which I guess in general it might not be, but I'm explicitly asking now, um, you know, if if you don't like the segment, we could just get rid of the segment and and not do it or make that its own separate thing um, and just have episodes be about general topics and less about figuring this stuff out. So please do, whether you like it, dislike it, or are indifferent, uh, if you could reach out and give that feedback about this Kingdom of the Week kind of segment, um, the bread to our metaphorical podcast sandwich as we've talked about many times in the past, um, then uh, I would ap- I would appreciate that kind of feedback. Um, having said that, I am going to go ahead and talk at least this week about this kingdom that we had from last week. And because it's been, okay, two weeks at least, um, well, I guess you could be listening to these episodes back to back at some point in the future. In the future. I mean, you're in the future right now as you're listening to it. Boy, I'm doing a really good job. At... Anyway, uh, we're going to talk about that kingdom right now, but I'm going to describe what the kingdom was, is my point, uh, for the audio listeners especially. So here we go. We have Stonemason, Menagerie, Cultist, Hunting Party, Vineyard, Ghost Town, Wandering Minstrel, Duke, Pillage, Rebuild, With the Landscape's Banquet, and Wedding. We have Vineyard, Stonemason, Menagerie, Ghost Town, Wandering Minstrel, Cultist, Hunting Party, Duke, Pillage, Rebuild, with the events, Banquet, and Wedding. And if you want alphabetical or some other order, again, leave that feedback, but uh, no promises. Uh, (laughs) Okay, so uh, I want to describe, first of all, the original game I played with here. Um, yeah, I went silver, silver, my opponent went wedding debt, I had 3-4. My opponent then got Menagerie and Wandering Minstrel as they, their gold missed the shuffle, which was super bad luck for them. Although, I also don't think that the Menagerie buy was good at all. Um, anyway, and I got Cultist on turn 3 and then Ghost Town on turn 4, and... Well, basically, to make a long story short, I won the Ruin Split 7-3, to three, and then we each went for some stuff, like we each got a rebuild, and that was okay, because there's the Ghost Towns. The Wandering Minstrels are particularly bad in the face of all the Ruins you're getting, because instead of cycling past cards that you typically don't want so much, and two cards that you do want so much, it cycles past your good treasures, and Ghost Towns, which, okay, is maybe not the hugest deal, but it doesn't cycle past the worst cards in your, well, not quite the worst cards, but close to the worst cards in your deck, which are the Ruins. So, like, Wandering Minstrel's pretty bad here. My opponent got multiples of them. Uh, Menagerie is actually a, a pretty fine card in these kinds of decks reasonably often, because like, you have a lot of different names of Ruins. It, it can be okay if you have the action space for it where you're not going to draw it dead like we do with the ghost town. So the menagerie in general is okay, although particularly I didn't like my opponent getting it early on where they did because if they would have gotten ghost town, then they would have guaranteed that they draw, well, they have 10 money in their deck. They would have guaranteed they draw the, the gold basically and and they reduce the possibility of missing out on five, which they did. Um, they also could have just gotten a silver would have been better than menagerie i think also uh that early in the game so anyway uh 
I won the Ruin split 7-3. I think going for rebuild from where I was was probably not very good because it shortens the game in a way where like every long game favors me. So I don't think that was great, but whatever. And I eventually ended the game with a Stone Mason overpay for two cultists, which uh, emptied the third pile because the the Ruins had run, obviously, and the Duchies ran from our buying and or rebuilding of it. Yeah, so that was how that went. Um, but I also played some with Adam, and I want to talk a little bit about, well, I think the most interesting part of the game is probably the opening. So on 4-3, I think I like Wedding and Pay Debt. On 2-5 or 5-2, you just get a cultist, and yeah, you just get a cultist. Uh, but on 4-3, I think, I think I like Wedding and Pay Debt. And on 3-4, I definitely like Silver Silver. And Adam likes Silver Ghost Town, and I think all of these are at least somewhat reasonable and none of them are like going to put you hugely behind uh, between those three options. Um, the reason why I like Silver Silver better than Silver Ghost Town, so first of all let's talk a little bit about this and I could go into this for like a whole episode probably so I'm going to try to keep it brief but basically Silver Ghost Town ensures that you're going to hit nine money. We have nine money in your deck and 11 cards. You're going to draw 11 cards on turns three and four and so you're going to guarantee that you're going to hit five or more exactly one time, right? You are going to hit either 5-4 or 6-3 or 7-2, some split like that, um, but you can't hit 5 twice and you can't fail to hit 5 when you're drawing all 9 of your money across two turns, right? So you're going to get a cultist and you're very likely to get, be getting exactly one cultist. The only way you get more than one is if you hit 7 um, on turn 3 by having, uh, yeah, well, silver and five coppers, right? Which is highly unlikely, but possible. Um, compared to silver, silver, whereas silver, silver, if you're willing to get a ghost town on turn three, if you hit three or four, you're still guaranteed to hit five or more. I'm not going to go through all the permutations here, but basically... The worst case is you hit four on turn three. There's still seven money in your deck. If you get the ghost town, you're going to be drawing all but one of the remaining cards in your deck. The most money that you can miss out of one card is if silver is the bottom card. And so that still leaves you with five, which is enough to buy a cultist. Um, you have some chance of hitting five, five. It's about 15% on turns three and four. So that is upside. It's not huge, but it's something. Um, and that's very, very good. And then you have a better chance of hitting seven, either by hitting you know, like three on turn four and then ghost towning into, you can miss up to a copper, or you get four on turn, uh, on turn three, I should say, you get the ghost town, and then you have on turn four, you can miss up to a copper and still hit seven to get a uh, stonemason overpay. You can obviously just hit seven naturally on turn three, which is unlikely, but happens a couple percent of the time. You can also uh, hit 5-5. Five, five. What is it? What else am I missing? Oh, if you hit 4, you can... If if you hit 4 on turn 3, then if an estate is the bottom card, you get the ghost town. You can still hit 7 on turn 4 and get 2 cultists that way. So anyway, long story short, I think you end up in a better spot there. And, well, the downside is uh, you're less likely to have a cultist a ghost town after turn four so going into that shuffle so you're going to be maybe a little bit slower if you do both get exactly one cultist but you also have the extra silver which i think is good although it's not 100 percent clear like hitting more sevens later for stonemason into double cultist is pretty good anyway that's where i came down on this um wedding yeah so wedding debt you're also if you decide to get the ghost town on turn three in the situation my opponent did in the actual game here, then you're guaranteed to hit um, at least five at least once. Um, you have some small chances of hitting five twice. It's You have some chances of uh, hitting seven to hit double five. That's less, I think, than the silver silver into ghost town. So I could see silver silver into ghost town being better, but also having the gold is probably a little bit better than having two so well not probably it's a little bit better than having two silvers basically for sure um and also right maybe you 
stone mace and the gold later, and then like the point isn't nothing. Um, this game can easily come down to a situation where you're trading like one for one. You, you get a duchy, I get a duchy, you get a duchy, I get a duchy, or the same thing with provinces in such a way that having an extra point is kind of nice at, at various times for, for pileouts and stuff. Um, as for what you should do later in the game, uh, well, I played a few games with Adam as well, and the biggest takeaway was it seemed to not matter very much. Uh, somebody is going to win the ruin split, and that's probably going to be most of the game. Um, on 7... Yeah, I'm not sure whether you should Wedding on 7 or Stone Mason overpay for two fives. I was getting like a couple cultists reasonably often. And with the number of ghost towns you get, because you get ghost town basically after a couple silvers, you're getting ghost town on 3 more or less every time over more silvers. You're usually going to have extra actions um, with that many ghost towns in your deck. So you're probably fine to play a terminal besides the cultists or whatever. So you get to stonemason some of the ruins. Tactically, you might stonemason a gold. You might stonemason cultists, so you don't auto-play all the cultists because you might want to stonemason one at the end. This is something you have to think about. So there's various decisions around that. Having said that, like, pillage is a card. When I had five, I thought was reasonable, especially when, when Adam had gone for rebuild. I think pillage is kind of good against that. It's kind of good. I mean, I was, I think, had a better deck there. I was up in the ruin split, and I think that lends itself a little bit more towards pillage than the rebuild because you kind of like you're just trying to take the one good card in their hand. That are more likely to have a higher difference of the power levels between their best and worst cards. So pillage is a little better. I think when you're behind, rebuild makes some more sense because you're just kind of rolling the dice a little bit more. But the differences are pretty small, and in any case, the differences are kind of small between kind of all of these. I wouldn't really recommend Hunting Party, I don't think. Almost ever. Um, yeah, Vineyards didn't seem so good. The other thing I want to briefly mention is that I don't know... The other thing I could see coming up at various points is, like, Banquet. Um, for one thing, it did come up a, a little bit in one situation where I was trying to steal a win being behind in the ruin split and I banqueted I was able to in some cases have the threat of banquet for cultist at the end if I missed five money and I needed to get the last cultist I could banquet for it but I also didn't think about like banquet openings and stuff and I my instinct is that I don't think that they're good but I haven't really delved into any depth on that but nobody suggested it because again we got no feedback on the kingdom so anyway that's Enough about this kingdom. Let's talk about the main topic I want to get into today, which is uh, three different cards, actually, but they're kind of similar. They all more or less produce money as their quote-unquote main effect, although whether that's the main effect or not, we'll get into. Um, so they all produce that. Um, they all cost five. They're all terminal actions. So let's just go right into it. We're going to start with Harvest. Harvest is a five-cost action card from the Cornucopia expansion. It says, reveal the top four cards of your deck, then discard them, plus one money per differently named card revealed. So Harvest is a bad card. It's a really bad card. It's honestly, I think, given all the changes that have happened with second edition and whatever, if you take the current card set from there and possibly excluding promo, I don't know, anyway, my point is, I think it might be the worst card that there's left, and that's maybe not very popularly held. I think a lot of people think Philosopher's Stone or something is worse, but whatever. It's kind of consensus to be bottom five. It's a very, very bad card. We want to talk about, well, knowing that it's bad is not just enough. We want to talk about why it's bad, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, so first of all, if you're drawing your deck, after you've drawn your deck, this card does nothing you don't have any cards in your deck, so you reveal nothing. You don't reveal any differently named cards, so you don't make any money. It does nothing for you once you've drawn your deck. So if you're building a deck where you're trying to draw your deck, which is often where, you know, payload gets maximized. Um, yeah, if you're building that deck, then you need to find a way to be able to either play this 
before you're drawing your deck, which means you need like extra terminal space because you need to be able to play this terminal and then still draw and not ever be in danger of running out of villages. Um, so like if you have a billion villagers from, I don't know, like academy and a bunch of villages or something, then maybe you can kind of sort of have that work kind of. Um, and, or like if you have uh, recruiter can also give you a billion villagers or, you know, champion obviously gives you infinite action. So like that gets around that problem. But even so, like if you're just blind flipping a harvest, it's probably going to make, I don't know, it makes around three on average in a lot of decks. I'm not going to go into specific math here because by George, it doesn't come up well enough. And I don't know who George is, but by him, it doesn't come up often enough. And it obviously depends a lot based on what your deck has in it. But, like, it makes two not infrequently. It makes four, you know, sometimes reasonably. Sometimes it makes one. That's not very often, but, like, can happen. You flip four coppers or something. It's pretty bad. Um, usually, like, most decks on average, it will make more than two. And I think usually somewhere around three. But, okay, like, it's a terminal gold with variability. It's not that... Terminal gold is not that great. And the variability... While sometimes it can help because it helps you spike, I think overall it tends to be worse. It makes it harder to plan out things. Um, yeah. So the other thing you could try to do with it in this kind of a situation where you're drawing your deck is you draw your deck, and then if you're able to, def to discard four specific differently named cards, then you can play a bunch of these, and you can make four money every time, which, hooray? But the problem with that is, A, first of all, you need some kind of a discard outlet. B, you need four differently named cards. C, if you're not going to redraw those cards, you need four differently named cards that weren't producing any money for you. So, like, if you're discarding a silver and a copper, you've given up three money to make four money end times, where n is the number of harvests. And, like, you're putting in a lot of work to make a card that still isn't making that much money at once. Even if it made four every time... Um, because you were able to perfectly set it up, that's still not great. It might be the best thing there is, but it's going to be very, very rare. Um, so, okay, when you're drawing your deck, the payoff is so small, the cost in terms of terminal space, in terms of it being five, in terms of all these different kinds of things, is very high. Yeah, you don't, you don't typically want it. Um, there's almost always going to be something that's better. Um, so what about in like a money-ish deck? Well, in a one-card kingdom, getting at least one harvest is better than getting zero harvests if you do that when you have exactly five. Um, so yeah, it tends to make at least two. Sometimes it makes only one, but you know, on average, typically it's going to make two to four, um, two to three usually. So like one copy is a little bit better than silver, and the second copy is probably better than silver but you have some terminal collision stuff and then it might not be better than silver I, I haven't checked this in a long time honestly i wouldn't be surprised if the second harvest is worse than silver the difference between just playing straight money and playing straight money where i get a harvest on my first five is quite i mean it's it's definitely real but it's pretty small um so you could say oh but you know i'm gonna play with some other differently named cards so harvest gets better and yeah it kind of does except once you start adding in other cards it's very hard to add in many other cards where those other cards aren't just better than harvest so yeah the big problem with harvest is that there's almost always something that's better for five and or almost always something that's a better use of your terminal space and or the difference between five and six isn't that big. So yeah, I could get a five, but I have six. I could get a six. I could get a gold. And gold is usually better than harvest in the big majority of situations. Um, or like all of the above. And that's going to be a recurring theme for all of these cards is that, yeah, there's often going to be something better in terms of the use of your terminal space and or your five cost buy or a cheaper buy, honestly. So like moat, big money moat is better than big money harvest. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's true. 
Mode is not a great money card, especially as a single card. Well, okay, Harvest probably plays a little bit better with other like cantrips and stuff than Moat, but my point is it doesn't take much to be better than Harvest. It really, really doesn't. Um, there's almost always a better use of your terminal space or your fibers or like just a four cost that's better. Like Monument, you get Monument every time before you get Harvest and money and probably in not money, even if you have five, just like Monument's a better card almost every time. Um, like the VP chip, yeah, the, the potential to getting more money, I don't know. Anyway, Harvest is bad. Um, the best uses I've found for Harvest. So there's some cute things you can do. You can um, you can reveal patrons. This is not good, but it's a thing you can do. Definitely helps Harvest a, a little bit, I guess. Uh, you can discard tunnels. Also definitely a bad thing to do, but, you know, uh, it, I've had it come up a non-zero number of times in the tens of thousands of games I've either played or watched. Um, I, I think it's happened once or twice. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, neither of these are good combos for Harvest. Neither of these should make you think, oh, well, maybe I should think about Harvest now. I'm just, like, trying to come up with, okay, the real things that Harvest does, there's, there's like, two to three things that, that Harvest really does for you. One, uh, you can swindle stuff into it. Uh, five costs are typically good. Harvest is... Honestly, it's not even that bad to be given in a lot of situations. So it's not like, man, I nailed them and gave them a completely useless counting house because they've trashed all their coppers. So counting house is completely worthless. You like, you know, it's not like that. It's rarely completely worthless. So it's not even that good to swindle into. Like Duke, well, maybe they're going to get a duchy at some point. So it'll be worth a point. Like... Harvest is is usually a better card than that, and it may not be the absolute worst fiver on the board in a reasonable percentage of games, although probably usually it, it still will be. So it's not even that great for Swindler, but Swindler is a definite use for Harvest. You swindle stuff into Harvest. The other thing, although, about Swindler games is, like, you're swindling their garbage into more differently named garbage, so, like, Harvest is probably better in a deck where you're getting your... You're getting swindled already, so that's like kind of weird. Anyway, it's still a bad card. Um, the other, the actual biggest use is you just need a differently named card or a differently named action card or you know something like that for your museum or fairgrounds or something. And like maybe it's not that bad of a card, so it's better to add than like curse or something. Or you need a differently. I don't know why you would need differently named specific actions. Um, I've trashed it with Lurker because I wanted to lower a pile, but I didn't want to give my opponent a chance to gain anything useful from their Lurkers. Like, real fringy stuff here, real fringy. Let's move on past Harvest, because it sucks. Uh, merchant Ship. Okay, so Merchant Ship is a five-cost action duration from the Seaside expansion, and it says, now and at the start of your next turn, plus two money. So this card is a lot better than Harvest. Um, yeah, it's four, four money from a single card, which is not bad. Um, like it always makes four money from a single card unless the game ends before you get your next turn. Um, it is split over two turns, so that's less good than if it was all right now. Um, yeah, if you're drawing your whole deck, then if you have two of these things, so you're playing one of them every turn, the make more money than gold they take up the same deck space because you're only ever drawing one per turn compared to gold. So they take up the same deck space. Although obviously it does take more terminal space and it costs more to get them because it's two five costs as compared to a six cost. It's usually harder to get the, the two merchant ships compared to a single gold. Um, so there are actually advantages here compared to gold Gold isn't a particularly high bar, of course, but it is a bar that was always there and, you know, well, not always there because sometimes you have exactly five, but, you know, always on the board and often a competitor for your five cost payload slot. Um, Harvest very, very rarely passes the gold test, but Merchant Ship, there's some real situations where it does. And again, usually the biggest downside of Merchant Ship is usually there's going to be something better better five to get, a better terminal to get, a better payload card to get. Some of the, one of the roles, whatever you're trying to get Merchant Ship to do, it usually there will be something better, but like 
it's not that crazy rare for there to come up to a spot in the game where like I, what I need at this point is payload and given my options, merchant ship is the best option. Again, usually in a significant majority of cases, there will be a better option, um, but it comes up in a not trivial amount of the time that merchant ship is that, that best option. Um, so yeah, I mean, sometimes gold is better, obviously, because like your gain amounts is pretty precious, your terminal space is pretty precious, stuff like that. Um, gold is, is still often, quite often going to be better than merchant ship, but uh, it's not always. Um, in money-ish kinds of decks, uh, I think merchant ship is again a little bit better uh, relatively because uh, yeah, it's not missing the shuffle every time. It does miss the shuffle more than whatever else you're buying. But it kind of, because of that, kind of takes up less terminal space too. So there's that. Um, the pacing out over every, getting it every turn is, yeah, so it makes four per shuffle if it doesn't miss the shuffle, which is nice. Like gold ever only makes three per shuffle. And if you're drawing your deck, then it only makes two per shuffle because you're shuffling every turn. But if you're not drawing your deck, then again, and unless it misses a shuffle, which again, because it's orange, it does miss a shuffle more often than non-orange cards, but it makes four per shuffle, which is a lot for a money-ish kind of deck, which most decks that aren't, well, many decks at least that aren't drawing themselves uh, fall in this range. So that's like a pretty good chunk of money in these kinds of decks. I mean, still, there's usually gonna be something better, but it's not like awful. It's perfectly serviceable and it's, like if you're just playing the again the three card kingdom not the three card kingdom i guess it's a one card kingdom right just merchant ship and nothing else you're just your normal base cards copper silver gold province estate that kind of stuff um merchant ship is better than gold your first merchant ship is is better than gold even on six and you usually want to get a few of them um and it's a pretty significant win rate over just straight money um Again, mostly that's because there's it's a five, which does something real and good for you. And not having anything to do on five in money is just like kind of a waste of your money. So it's not that it's particularly good, but it's a big upgrade over, you know, like nothing or, or silver in these kinds of decks, especially if your terminal space isn't particularly tight. It's a fine terminal to add, not a great terminal to add, not even maybe a good terminal to add, but a fine one like it's not embarrassing again there's still just like uh gear much better for money much better for everything basically militia the discard attack well that's more that it's good against money but militia is very good better card even if you have five you know I'd rather have a deck with a militia than a merchant ship in the big majority of cases yeah, if all you care about is just like money density and there's no ancillary effects, then merchant ship's your man or your card, I guess. It's not a man, it's a card. Stop anthropomorphizing cards, Wandering Winter. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of combos or synergies or anything, there's really very little. Um, but one thing that, that can come up is if you're playing a deck where you are drawing a bit and Storyteller is the basis of that, um, but maybe your village light, although you have to have enough village space to have a merch. I don't know. The point is because you get the money at the start of your turn, it can draw you an extra couple cards with your storytellers, which can help your reliability and being able to draw enough. So that's like some small, but real, well, real small synergy. <laughs> we'll put it like that. Um, the last one of these cards I want to talk about and the reason why we're going through three, as you can tell, is there's some similarities between them in terms of the opportunity cost on payload space, terminal space, all this kinds of five cost space is similar. That's part of it. And part of it is also these cards are all pretty bad, so there's not a ton to say about them. So that's why we're going past going for three. But the last one I want to talk about is Mandarin. And Mandarin, I would say, is the most interesting of the three. Um, don't know if it's quite the best 
what's best is always situational so that's going to be something I probably tend to harp on a lot but situationally you have to look at everything differently but okay anyway um, Mandarin yeah it's a five cost action card from the Hinterlands expansion oh one last thing on merchant ship <laughs> uh, Bob the editor is going to love that I've gone back and forth here so you're welcome Bob um, by the way if you didn't get that there is no Bob the editor Adam edits all these things thank you for that Adam um, hat tip uh, show a nice show, get that picture of that headshot up Adam a nice smile of yourself yeah give yourself give yourself anyway um, merchant ship is obviously a duration card which um, means some rules things but the other thing I want to point out in terms of synergy is courtier it is a card with two types and it's not that embarrassing to put in your deck for courtier so you get like one or two and turn all your courtiers into Okay, I don't really know. This isn't a very good plan, but um, it does have two types, so, you know, there you go. Um, of course, like, if that's your plan, maybe you should have just gotten courtier. Anyway, it's probably not actually a combo. The Not actually a combo because they directly compete with each other as five-cost payload cards. Anyway, Mandarin. Mandarin is a five-cost action card from the Hinterlands expansion. It says plus three money. Put a card from your hand onto your deck. And then there's this horizontal line thing that a lot of cards have. And below the horizontal line it says, when you gain this, put all treasures you have in play onto your deck in any order. This is another not great card. The play effect is not so bad though. Um, you want to make the put a card from your hand onto your deck from that play effect into a positive thing for you if you're playing with this cards, but it's not that hard to make that a positive thing. Right, in a money-ish deck, it can provide you some smoothing. Kind of like courtyard money is, is pretty reasonable money because you get to deal with terminal collision, so you get to add more terminals than you otherwise would because you get to stick the extra terminal on top of your deck, so that's a thing. But also, just like, if you don't have terminal collision, you can figure out kind of what the maximally efficient use of your money is and stick back whatever's left. So like if you have seven, you can stick a copper back and buy a gold. If you have um, nine, then you can de determine whether you want to stick a copper back and buy a province or stick a gold back and buy a gold or, you know, something like that. If you have five, maybe you stick a silver back and buy a silver and then you have more money next turn. And right, you can, you get to, to play around with that a, a, a bit. And that is, a pretty big advantage for money-ish kinds of decks because not wasting the money is a is a pretty big thing. Now, obviously, if you have good things at all different price points in your money-ish deck, then that's less of an advantage. But pretty often, it's it's a pretty big advantage to be able to smooth yourself like that. Um, so that's that's kind of nice in a money-ish deck. And if you're drawing your deck, then sticking a card back on top of your deck can help to provide you with consistency. So like you have an extra village and you're overdrawing by one. Um, it's not that much to have to overdraw and you get to always start with a village which is you know a big boost to the consistency of your deck so you can stick something back there um, it's not always free uh, to have to stick something back though so don't just assume oh well, this is a good effect in all kinds of decks so like it can be a good effect in a lot of different kinds of decks but um, it isn't it isn't always, right? Sometimes you're just very tight on cards and you end up having to stick back bad cards a lot and that's that's quite a bad thing. Um, in, uh, I should mention, I guess, uh, for this like crop rotation is kind of a, a combo with the on play effect like that because you, you stick a green card back on top of your deck. Green card was doing nothing for this turn, you this turn and now I for sure have a green card next turn for crop rotation. Um, so like, that's a, that's a thing you can do, but it's not like, it's like, oh, that's a combo. It's just like a nice little kind of little synergy. Um, and there's other things like that, but that's just one example of that. And you typically want to have some kind of synergy or just be in a reasonably pleasant position, um, to be able to make use of that, put a, putting a card from your hand on top of your deck, that kind of smoothing reliability uh if if you want mandarin to be good for you um yeah sometimes it's good sometimes it's not so you want to watch out for that and figure out you know is it is it good or not um three four 
a terminal. Yeah, again, this isn't great payloads, like three money for a terminal. Um, it's not the worst if you have the terminal space. Like, yeah, it's not great at all. It's quite mediocre, but, you know, sometimes you hit exactly five and not six. Sometimes, I don't know, you, you have the Mandarin. I don't know. Uh, you want to throw it. You don't want to throw it that often because you got to stick multiple cards back. And you usually don't want to stick multiple cards back. So I, I don't know. Um, it's it's kind of hard for the three to be particularly good itself, like just as a card. Like it's one option on count. And it's an option you take sometimes on count, but it's usually not like, I'm getting a count to do Mandarin's job. Like, no. It's a thing you can do, but when it's the only thing it does after you've gained it, it's... Again, usually it's the same thing as all these other cases, right? It's The problem is that there's usually something better in terms of your terminal space, in terms of your payload, in terms of your five costs. So that's the big problem. But what I haven't really gone into depth about is the most interesting part of the card, and that's the below the line, the when you gain this, put all treasures you have in play on your deck in any order. That is usually rather a bad thing. And that's usually the biggest reason why you don't want to get Mandarin is because, like, I want to play all my treasures usually to maximize my payload this turn, which usually involves me playing some treasures which are below average cards in my deck. Coppers, or if somehow I don't have any coppers, like, silver's probably a below average card in my deck if I don't have any coppers in my deck, because I'm usually in that situation I'm trying to draw, and silver in my starting hand doesn't help me draw. It hinders me from drawing. Like, silver's an okay card in the deck, maybe, but your opening hand is exactly where you don't want the silvers. You want to draw them at the end. If you had to draw them at the beginning, then we might not always say silver's a good card. We might say the silver's a bad card, because, like, that's exactly the downside of silver in these kinds of decks. And if you're ensuring that you have that downside to it, then that, yeah, that's not so great. And, like, it's not like the payoff for doing that is that great e either. So, like, yeah, usually that that is a bad thing, um, the top decking of the treasures you have in play. Um, there's a number of ways, though, to make it work for you. And when you can make it work for you is usually when Mandarin is actually an actively good card. And sometimes it's a very good card because you can make very good use out of it. And it's often very situational, but it's not always situational. Sometimes it's strategic. And the biggest way it's strategic is the biggest way that Mandarin is good, and that's the combo with capital. Now, the combo, 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 combo. Uh, it's a there's a magic card called combo. I think I didn't mean that. anyway. The combination wombination between Mandarin and capital is very powerful. It's um, one of the best few two-card combos there is in the game. Um, and there is an article that has been written about it, so I'm not going to go into mega depth here. There's an article by Dan Brooks, which is highly recommended, um, that goes into this combo and how it works and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to go through, you know, rules-wise how it works. And basically, uh, so capital, when you discard it from play, gives you six debt. Um, when you gain a Mandarin, you put all your treasures in play. You don't discard them. You put them on top of your deck from play. So they don't get discarded. So you don't take the debt. So if you gain a Mandarin with the capital in play, the capital was just plus six money plus a buy, which is very good. So that's the idea, basically, is you get some number of capitals, a few capitals, and then when you have them in play, you buy a something and a mandarin or you buy a mandarin and something and you keep doing that so every turn you have these capitals in your hand because you put them on top of your deck they're in your next turn um, you have these capitals in hand you buy something with them and you buy a mandarin and you do the same thing the next turn right if you have two capitals and any other treasure that makes some money in your hand then um, you can that's at least 13 money um, and you can every turn go province plus Mandarin. If you have three capitals and three money from two or fewer other treasures in your hand, then you can go double province and Mandarin. 
and you can work things out from there. Eventually, the mandarins do potentially run out, so like you kind of have a plan for that. But it, it usually doesn't like matter that much. Um, you do have to worry a little bit about a couple of attacks. Sometimes hand size attacks means you're only ever going to stick three capitals, uh, well, three cards, uh, three treasures. Possibly they're capitals. Possibly one of them's not a capital. Um, so like if you're getting hand sized attack, yeah, you're only gonna have three or four cards. And then of course minion, like so often happens, wrecks this combo hard. Um, how you optimize this, all the specifics of what you get and different considerations and how that can affect you and all of that. I'm gonna leave that combo article or various advice you can find in other places. I'm not gonna go into, um, yeah, that stuff. Um, but there's some other stuff too uh, that's not nearly as strong as Mandarin Capital that you can do with the Mandarin on gain effect. Uh, I don't really want to call them combos because they're not anywhere remotely close to as powerful as that one and they're really not combo tier. They're just like some synergies that can come up. Um, and a lot of these are in the forms of quote unquote golden decks where you're playing the same cards every turn no matter what cards get added to your deck. Again, they can get messed up by particularly minion, sometimes hand size attacks, whatever. Um, but so if you have four differently named treasures and a horn of plenty, you can play your four differently named treasures, play your horn of plenty to gain a mandarin, and that's your five card hand for next turn, and it's your five card hand for next turn, your five card hand for next turn, rinse and repeat. So you need four differently named treasures, which means you need any other kingdom treasure or platinum. Uh, and then what you can what this gets you is whatever those four other treasures make you in terms of money or other payloady output uh you can buy that so like if you have a, a i don't know a royal seal <laughs> then you can um every turn buy a province and gain a the mandarin and rinse and repeat Right now, you have to somehow set up getting four differently named treasures in your hand along with Horn of Plenty, which is not usually that easy to do. And well, okay, sometimes it is easy to do, but usually when it is, it's because you can draw a fair amount. When you can draw a fair amount, like gaining a province every turn and gaining a Mandarin every turn is usually like not really the best thing you can be doing because like Horn of Plenty is on the board and you can draw a bunch of cards, so. It's kind of slow, but like if you wake up with it on turn early, uh, I don't know what turn number, but like if somehow you wake up with it on early turn, then maybe you can go for it and you like audible into this and maybe it's fast enough there. Uh, I don't know. But um, any collectors, collection of treasures which gives extra gains and enough money and fits in a five card hand or, okay, fits in, in a starting hand, I should say. So like, Hireling can help this, Prince can help this, enough extra money and gains to buy an expedition, I guess, can help this. Um, so like plus buy is going to be useful here and sometimes. Uh, so like fortune is the big one here because like I have gold, gold, fortune, that's uh, 12 money. Let's say I have a copper, gold, gold, copper, fortune, then I can buy province and mandarin and rinse and repeat. Um, yeah, fortune enables that money wise and gains wise a lot but again the problem is you have to get all this stuff together and like you did all this work and you got a fortune isn't there something better to do i think there usually is but you know other treasures which give extra gains um we talked about horn of plenty we talked about fortune spices could do it counterfeit could do it there's some other things that can do it right charm could do it um charm you know you have five money plus the charm you can get a duchy and a mandarin every turn <laughs> like yeah i don't know uh <laughs> this stuff is usually not very good but situationally it can come up right and so i guess don't necessarily just sleep on it um but actually situationally is not like my whole game plan but just i want to use this effect one time on my mandarins is uh, something to think about, right? So the the this usually comes up um, 
well in a couple of situations. I'm going to start with towards the late game, right? I can't quite close out the game. Uh, maybe I've drawn my deck, and I, but I can't quite pile out on like provinces or something. I can get, somehow if I can gain a Mandarin, I can put the treasures on top of my deck, which is usually bad in this kind of deck. But if it guarantees me the next turn that I have that last province that I need, then you can do that sometimes to guarantee that as opposed to like, I don't know, I just gained a bunch of green cards, so now I might not kick off and I want to just eliminate all chances of a dud because that's the only thing that can make me lose. You can gain a Mandarin in that spot. More likely you're playing like uh, a money-ish thing. And uh, so the situational thing I should note, we're calling that hashtag tactical Mandarin, not strategic Mandarin. Hashtag tactical Mandarin, not hashtag strategic Mandarin. So the ta hashtag tactical Mandarin uh, comes up more often like in a money kind of deck because you have more good treasures more often. Um, so in these situations, maybe it's getting closer to the end of the game. A duchy isn't going to help you very much or is maybe not that likely to help you very much. Um, you have, you know, two golds in hand or you have a gold and a silver in hand, or if you have a gold and two silvers in hand, or three silvers in hand, or something like that. You can play those. Uh, probably not play your coppers, although I guess you could play a copper, depending on how you're tracking your deck or whatever. You play those good treasures, the golds and the silvers. You buy a mandarin, instead of getting a duchy or another gold or something, to give you a much better chance at next turn hitting that crucial province. Um, again, in a lot of situations, what you want to get is a hashtag duchy. But in some situations that really do come up, depending on where the point differences are, maybe the province is just more or less the only thing that matters. And a hashtag tactical Mandarin just as a way to like, I'm probably never playing this Mandarin, but I'm just trying to end the game favorably for myself, uh, can be very good there. Um, uh, oh, the other hashtag man tactical Mandarin thing before I forget is crown. If you're only treasures in your deck, or like a crown or a couple of crowns, then you can start your deck with crown or a couple of crowns in play by gaining a, a, a Mandarin. Or, well, the, the last thing I want to talk about uh, with the hashtag tactical Mandarin and, um, is the early game, right? So first of all, in turns one or two, if you have five, two as your split, you can just pile the mandarins do not do that like oh i should explain what i mean so like on turn one i have five i buy a mandarin i put five coppers back on my deck turn two i draw five coppers i buy a mandarin i put five coppers back on my deck you keep doing this until the mandarins run out you can do that do not do that it's very bad because at the end of it it's 10 turns into the game you have a deck that's 10 mandarins and you're starting cards and that deck hits five pretty reliably, not even 100% reliably, but pretty reliably. Great. That's not great at all, especially given that you've taken so long to get there, right? And you're still going to have this, like, turn 11, I have five coppers, and turn 12, I have two coppers, and it's not until turn 13 that I can actually play my first Mandarin, and, like, a lot of games are, like, done by turn 13, and, okay, a lot of times they're not, especially if you're not helping your opponent at all, but still, like, this is very bad. Do not do this. Sometimes you get one Mandarin. Usually you don't. Again, usually there's a much better five to get, but, like, even if there isn't, maybe if there is, whatever. Um, usually you don't. You just want to get on with getting to your other stuff because you don't want to delay your shuffle. You want to be doing the other stuff that's a lot more powerful because it's not like Mandarin is a great card. It's better than your starting cards, but it's not like a great card in your deck, right? So you usually don't want to get one at all, and when you get one, you almost never want to get more than one. Um, but usually when you do want to get one, I should, I should talk about when you'd want to do that. Usually why you would do that on turn one or two is you've got some very specific circumstances to where the Mandarin is going to be good. You're trashing Usually it's you're trashing a lot very fast. And so like you could just trash rid of the rest of your economy quite quickly. Um, yeah. So like you've got donate. Um, 
yeah, you 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 might go Mandarin Donate. Um, mint, right? Uh, if I buy Mint on turn one or two, then I don't. I only have two money in my deck. But if I got a Mandarin first, then I have more than two money, and maybe that's the best way of thinning in the kingdom, and like that can come up. In these cases where you get the Mandarin, it's not like Mandarin is great. It's certainly not. It's not that good, really. But it might be the best thing. So like. Don't just completely dismiss it. Um, where early mandarins are typically more useful, in my experience, is not on turns one and two, though. It's on, like, turns three and four. Um, and specifically what I'm talking about here is during your your first reshuffle or your before your second reshuffle is what I really mean. So that might be longer than turns three or four, as we're about to say. Uh, but typically is, you know, in a typical game, that would be like turns three and four. Um, so using and holding back treasures very hashtag tactically for your hashtag tactical Mandarin can be uh, really helpful in these situations for spiking price points, right? Any five money hand that isn't exactly five coppers, you can use a hashtag tactical Mandarin on turns three and four to get six. You just can. Because if you have five money, uh, this is assuming you've opened silver, silver, right? If you have five money that's not five coppers, you have silver in your hand. And if you don't already have six money, you have an estate in your hand. And so, right, you have silver, copper, copper, copper. If you didn't hit six this turn and you didn't hit six last turn, then there's at least one copper left in your deck. So you can buy a Mandarin, and then if I don't hit six my next turn because I draw an estate, which is pretty unlikely, then I could buy a Mandarin the next turn and then I'm going to hit six, right? Um, ideally, you're not going to have to get two Mandarins. Usually, you're not. You, very often, you only have to get one. If you have two silvers in hand, then like, you're guaranteed to get it the next turn, right? Silver, silver, copper. You're going to be drawing at least one copper the next turn. Um, and so you're going to be able to hit six pretty quickly doing this, um, you know, before turn, well, before that shuffle, right? That would normally happen after turn four, but you're delaying it because you're getting the Mandarin, so it's not happening, the shuffle isn't happening quite as fast. But you're getting to six pretty quickly. Now, in order for this to be good, it needs to be worth slowing yourself down and putting a mandarin in your deck so you want to have a really impactful early six and there aren't very many of them but it can come up sometimes like crop rotation uh we already talked about crop rotation having some synergy with mandarin so like yeah mandarin crop rotation money it's a thing i mean it's not really a thing because like again usually there's something better but like you could do worse right um because you're going to be able to get that crop rotation a large percentage of the time before your that shuffle and then you can stick back to always feed your crop rotation the mandarin's not that bad in that kind of a deck right whatever so crop rotation is a thing you can get with your six sometimes other sixes that are particularly good to have early i don't know what they might be maybe it's captain with a good captain board mm, is mandarin really what you want in that deck i don't know maybe it's altar maybe it's artisan maybe it's goons but like i don't know if it's really worth slowing yourself down and getting a mandarin just to get the early goons like you're gonna get the goons soonish anyway right so i don't know of course for all of this guarantee and kind of stuff to happen you need to have gone silver silver and that's itself a cost um but even if you haven't gotten silver silver if you're like just tracking your shuffles then maybe it's not a guarantee prima facie but like if you're tracking your shuffles you might want to hashtag tactical mandarin anyway to be able to hit the six it's like a thing that can come up even if you only have one silver or something right um yeah the other thing is that you can usually hit seven um uh, i don't have precise math on this but um it, it's actually quite a similar thing right if you have five on turn um three then you're going to be able to find two coppers or the other silver before the end of the shuffle. Um, yeah, you're, you're going to hit seven. If it's on turn four, 
then if you've already missed you know one of your two silvers then um, yeah you, you can't get there but if you, if you haven't seen both of your silvers already and you have five including one silver then you can always just keep mandering until you hit the second silver and you can get seven that way um, so basically you just need to hit five before you've seen either you know the before you've had a silver go by so unless you hit five coppers or you hit silver with less than five money on turn three you're going to be able to hit seven there again you need a seven that you that's worth hitting very occasionally uh canal is worth it or forge maybe um but your biggest bet there is going to be inheritance is the usual reason you'd want to hit seven um, but it's something to think about here, right? It's something to think about. Um, so, but you have to weigh, obviously, you're adding a mander into your deck, you're slowing down the shuffles. It's not always worth it, but it's hashtag tactical mandarin is definitely something to think about, and it's the last thing we're covering uh, here. You said that was the last thing to talk about? Ooh, get edge case, bro! So... You can also use the on gain of Mandarin to play the same treasures multiple times in the same turn. To do that, all you need is a way to play treasures after drawing them, after gaining a Mandarin, after putting treasures in play. Who cares that you can't do that very often? There's like so many ways. There's Venture with Horn of Plenty, where you venture into a Horn of Plenty and gain a Mandarin and stick treasures back, and then you play more ventures to get your Horn of Plenties again, or whatever other treasures. Yeah, there's capitalism and action treasures with Horn and with Horn of Plenty, right? Yeah, uh, there's Villa and any way to draw cards. You can redraw your treasures and play them again, and it actually makes you like significant money, maybe depending on how easy it is to draw. There's Storyteller, and then any card that can gain. Uh, any action that can gain a Mandarin. You've got University, you've got Altar, you've got Artisan, you've got an edge case to the edge case where you have more exotic stuff like cost reduction and a workshop, cost reduction and an ironworks, uh, uh, capitalism and a uh, tragic hero, capitalism and a hero, smugglers yeah there's black market and all the same stuff was with storyteller plus black market and you just buy the mandarin out of the black market sure you need a ton of card draw but who cares to make it worth it but who cares this is edge case with wandering with all right so let's look at the kingdom for next time and again this kingdom doesn't have any of these cards in it because I'm actually going with actual games I've played. Uh, so the kingdom from last time was kingdom number 29870587, if you're using the Dombot in Discord, or you're looking it up on Woodcutter. Um, the kingdom for this one is kingdom 29871895, if you want to spoil yourself. This doesn't include any of the cards, though, because I only have a list of games that I thought were interesting that... Uh, yeah, games that I thought were interesting that I played in. And uh, there aren't too many of those that have the three cards we talked about. Uh, there probably are some, but anyway, this is, the, this is the kingdom I chose. Let's read the kingdom, especially for these audio-only listeners who can't be looking at it. Um, so we have Candlestick Maker, Haven, Rat Catcher, Ghost Town, Exorcist, Miser, Worker's Village, Den of Sin, Embassy, Venture, with the project crop rotation and the event training. Once more, for our audio only listeners, we have Candlestick Maker, Haven, Rat Catcher, Ghost Town, Exorcist, Miser, Workers Village, Denison, Embassy, Venture, with the landscapes, uh, crop rotation, and training. Yeah, what are we doing here? Again, I'm not going to comment right now because I'm going to wait for what happened in the game because I actually played this game and I've had time to look at it. Uh, so I'm not going to comment on my thoughts on it uh, until next episode. But we have Adam's thoughts and 
He says, the thinning options are in Terrasante. Do you open with an exorcist? Do you get one at all? How much do you thin? Embassy makes me want to green earlier. And then uh, he's wondering about crop rotation a little bit. But he says he's very tempted by exorcist, embassy, and money here, TBH. Yeah. Um, and then we have Jake. Now, what Jake wanted to do was, um, well, something involving uh, getting miser and using misers. Um, thinning with Exorcist and trying to play around with that combination of Worker's Villages and probably eventually a training, I think, on Worker's Village, I think. Um, so he was thinking about basically playing with a, a Miser deck with an Exorcist there. Um, but he's slightly concerned uh, that uh, he's not going to be able to hit four early as often enough as he needs. Uh, but still, he thinks that's what he would go for. Um, he at least thinks it's interesting and, and worth testing. So um, if we get a chance to be playing some games in between next week and now, which is a backwards order to say that, in between now and when the next episode is, uh, we will be testing out that plan. We will be testing out my plan, which I haven't described yet. We'll be testing out uh, maybe Adam's plan. Um, and we'll be testing out any plans that you want to describe. So do send in your plans. What do you think is good on this kingdom? What should we do? We'll test those if and as we can. Time for the next episode, which will be about a topic I haven't decided yet. So if you have a topic request, send that feedback in too. If you want a pizza roll, you're out of luck, or you can like go to a grocery store and get one. Um, but in any case... Um, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have comments, questions, feedback of any sort, hopefully you know how to reach us. There's Discord, there's email, there's Pigeon, uh, Messenger Pigeon, there's Post Office if you could somehow find our address, there's the forums, there's all different kinds of ways. Um, yeah. Um, I don't think we have a website. It's just Adam's website, adamhorton.com. You can find stuff there. Yes, that's it. Thanks for listening. Talk to you again. Well, I say next week. It may not be next week. It may be a couple weeks. Whenever the next episode is. It might be five minutes from now. It could be five seconds from now because, like, you know, uh, you're listening to these not just, like, right as they come out. You're listening to them at some later point in time. Maybe you're listening to this... Uh, maybe you're listening to this uh, hundreds or thousands of years into the future past the time where I've died. Um, it's possible. You, you could be listening to it then, in which case uh, you, you could listen to the next episode whenever you want, unless, like, maybe I die before the next episode gets recorded. Who knows? It could happen. Um, I, I hope it doesn't happen. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, that's... It's a lovely thought to end on. I'm not going to end on that thought. We've got to come up with something else to end on, right? The point is, you could be far into the future listening to this. And uh, if so, great. And uh, if so, if you want to leave feedback, uh, it's going to be a little bit harder, maybe. Like, if the next episode's already been recorded, then I'm probably not going to be able to get, take your feedback on the kingdom and, and play with it. So that's that's a downside of listening into the far future. An upside is you can just, like, listen to the next episode. You can, like, wait as long as you want to figure out what you want to do on the kingdom and then as soon as you figured that out you can listen to the next episode right away and like get quote unquote the answer although it's not like I'm going to have a guaranteed 100% this is definitely right answer like even the last one I was, was pretty sure about some of the stuff but like I didn't even talk about banquet openings right so like I don't know you don't know if that was something you were thinking about I didn't address it, it sucks for you so, like, there's trade-offs, right? Do you want to listen to it in the far future? Do you want to listen to it right now? I don't know. I like the interactivity. I like hearing feedback. I like talking to you guys. Um, I'm just making a podcast to listen to myself talk. I probably wouldn't. So, um, yeah, if you don't like the sound of my voice, you you can tell me that. I, I'm not going to be able to do much about it, but you could, you could tell me if you want. I, I don't know. Um, I'm playing with a container of graphite, 0.7 millimeters, for my uh, mechanical pencils, which I almost never use, because like, 
usually by the time I'd run out of graphite for a mechanical pencil, I've lost the mechanical pencil or I just move on to the next one anyway. So I've had this refill container, which I haven't refilled in ever. It's been years at least, so I don't know. But it has this thing and I open and close and uh, I do that a lot, um, kind of absentmindedly. I do that with a lot of like remote controls. There's invariably some part, usually on the back, where there's a, a little door that opens so you can change the batteries and stuff. I like incessantly open and close those to the point where I wear them out. My family members get like somewhat exasperatedly upset with me about that. But like, I don't know. On the other hand, like how expensive is it to buy another remote versus the amount of enjoyment that I get from absentmindedly doing that? I don't know that that's not like the most cost effective entertainment value I've ever bought probably a deck of a deck a deck of standard playing cards it's probably more cost effective I don't know it's point is I think it's like a reasonably cost effective for because I'm really weird and I enjoy doing that but I also like just enjoy absent-mindedly shuffling decks of cards and like I do stuff I move around I do stuff with my hands a lot um and uh I'm really impressed that you're still listening to this because I've just been like droning on for quite a while now and kind of surprised that Adam didn't like edit down this post episode whatever bonus easter egg anymore but obviously he didn't because you've listened to all of this and this is all on the thing so I know you're still listening right now and congratulations to you you have fine taste in listening to the end parts of podcasts um yeah I guess I'm just gonna end on this if Donkey Kong is a monkey then why is he called donkey kong life's mysteries <laughs>